shall be stunned and amazed. Oh, thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Hey, I, when I first moved here, now almost 25 years ago, and started looking around and started some thought process. For those of you who don't know, uh, one of my first careers was working as a research historian and a museum educator. And I worked in maritime museums and industrial uh, museums. And through different, I wound up here because I was making sales and came to work with Ed Rowe. Um, and through the backside of things, there's always questions in my head. When I moved here, I'd look at the slabs that we find right out here in the water and was like, huh, look at those. And I accepted in my mind that these were here because this was a lumbering industry, like much of Michigan, uh, northern Michigan, and this is what you would find here. And didn't think that much about it. Now, the proof has been, over the past 20-some years, in the past 20 years of helping put docks in and out and driving pilings, that if you scratch the surface, it's a carpet of slabs, of pine slabs. This past summer, uh, we had, Tom Lakota and I will tell you that uh, we had our lifts, actually both of them, fail. And so towards the end of the season, we were launching our center console, the club center console, um, each and every time we used it and retrieving it. And doing that, we kind of hot launched, in which we dropped it in and just scooted right off. And after repeated use, we kind of blew a big hole at the base of the launch ramp. What you see there is a stack of slabs, just right there. And just look at it and going, huh, that kind of confirms some ideas in my head. This is just another um, different angle. You can see the reflection that, that's right at the base of the launch ramp. Now, I'd already been working on this project but it just kind of sped things up in my mind. I'm gonna tell you, I got a lot of information here. I'm gonna go really quick. If you, somebody wants to come back for the four hour version, we can book some time. But, oh, it's passive. So there's some stuff here that's gonna somewhat blow your mind. So just in the prologue here, when the club was organized in 1960, it was based, um, at what we now call Harbor, Harbor West, or the uh, Darrow Marine, and then Rennie Marine. And from the get-go, the idea was to have a permanent facility. Now, the first option was a clinch marina discussion. Not going to happen. But moving on towards 1965, um, a plan was come up. Gordon Cornwell, um, who was active lightning sailor, powerboat owner, and one of the first 10 Commodores um, was in contact with another of our charter members, Pete Rennie, who lived next door. Um, at that time, they had, um, with Gordon Cornell, architect, they had plans drawn for a new clubhouse that would be essentially at where Elmwood Marina is today. And they were literally in the, at the end of 1965, um, ready to break ground, but, Pete Rennie, um, who earlier had brought up the concept, he actually had passed in the spring of um, 1965. That's a whole other story. But um, he had brought up the idea of the defunct monomower factory, which in 1965 looked something like this. I know we're, the number of people who were club members before the fire are, were beginning to be in the minority. And this was definitely an industrial facility that was built of um, cement block in its first incarnation. It was, you can see there on the screen how that looked. It was four quadrants. What became the club was the southeast quadrant, right there. Now, uh, brief discussions were had, debates back and forth, coming up with a deal with the Montague family, and a, a deal was struck. 
Part of the argument, you'll be glad to know, people had concerns about parking. <laughs> so yeah. this was the fundamental Grand Traverse, the original sin was parking. But, as you can see, they, their concerns were more about because when the entire building took up essentially our footprint of the entire parking lot. You know, that was a real question. So, a deal was struck and a land contract was written for $35,000. And the club took possession. The land uh, contract was cleared in 1981. But this is a picture of the first uh, cleanup day at this facility in um, 19, the spring of, actually, I'm sorry, this is 1966. The deal was struck at the end of 1965. And actually, Gordon Cornwell is to your far left. Um, just because I'm here and I look at these pictures every day, at least in the Commodore's room. Gordon Cornwell's right there. There's a whole bunch of past Commodores in there. Um, that's Bob Auer. Um, that up high right there is past Commodore Bob Cornwell, who's away in North Carolina at the moment. He'll be back, but familiar faces. And so that originally how is how we landed here in one sense. What I'm going to tell you, the rest of the story, is why we landed here at kind of a culmination of a huge amount of factors. Um, it's no coincidence, because the real question I put like out with the mail today, you know, the, we're going to answer the question, why are we here? But not in the philosophical sense, the literal sense, why are we here? But the question, other question is, why does a mower factory be, need waterfront property? We're going to find that out. So, way back when, we're going to start with a man named Thomas Cutler, who was born in 1822. I don't know how much you folks know about the first days of Traverse City and what was the, uh, what was the Anglo settlement the arrival of the white people. There was already civilization here. But white people, once they came, started coming um, with, of course, the old mission settlement. And then in the late 1840s, uh, the lumber industry. This is where our story starts. First person involved here was named Thomas Cutler. Now you're saying, Jordan, you're showing me a picture of the intersection of front and division. What I see is the site of the first sawmill in Traverse City. At the crossing of Division, slightly north of the front Division intersection, uh, is where what we now call Kids Creek passes underneath the road. This was the site of the Boardman Sawmill. When Perry Hanna came to scout Traverse City to potentially buy it from the Boardman family, this is what he found. He found a mill, a water-driven mill, on this location. Uh, Captain Henry Boardman, who owned the land, the 200 acres that would form Traverse City, had left his uh, son Horace Boardman in charge, but he was a bit of an underachiever. And in four years, they had not produced necessary lumber to make a larger sawmill, which would have been at approximately the 8th Street Bridge. And there was a lumber price depression at the time. So the Boardman family, Kevin Boardman, was looking to move on. Perry Hanna saw the opportunity and cut the deal. Just so you know, next time you go, for those of you who live on the west side, west side, and you go to the Ace Hardware, go stepping back. Take a look down the hill into the backyard of the coffee place next door. They built this nice little bridge. It's very simple. That's the mill pond that was dammed, essentially where the river is, where, I'm sorry, where the road is. And this mill pond powered the sawmill. And that, that mill pond extended all the way back to 7th Street. So my first house in Traverse City, it was on Cedar Street. I always told people it was Waterview property because I saw Kids Creek, crazy nonsense. So now, Thomas Cutler was brought basically in the first wave of Hanalei employees. 
He was 29 years old, and he was the engineer who built the first sawmill, uh, the first steam sawmill on the waterfront. What you see here the, on, the, on the left was the original sawmill. That's approximately, that's more or less right across from the parking lot where Wes parks when he goes to clinch. Um, that is the larger Hanalei sawmill, which you see in most of the old pictures. But Cutler was brought to build the steam sawmills, and that he did. The Hanalei original store is over here. This is a picture from 1860. There's the propeller Allegheny right there, uh, Marion Islands back there. And this picture is probably more or less taken from basically the parking lot across the street from the post office. There was so much, so much of nothing, just stumps. This house is on Front Street right there. So well, there we go. So now at this time, basically the area had only been surveyed, oops, had only been surveyed, oops, let me get there, had only been surveyed in 1847 and then a second survey which corrected that in 1851. This is a survey of basically what we call Elmwood Township today. Our story, in surveying sense, is about Section 33, which is down here. Section 33, Township 28, lot number three. Uh, this was the day of unclaimed land that land was available to purchase that was virgin land for, you know, of course, for white settlement. We thought it was, well, of course, we're just going to take it and we're going to buy it, we're going to sell it, we're going to buy it, and exploit the resources. Now, um, as that sounds a little aggressive, exploit the resources. First 50 years of Traverse City, 40 years, was more or less about the extraction of resources. Keep in mind that the total value of lumber taken from uh, Michigan in the second half of the 1800s exceeded the value of all the gold removed from California in the same time period. So that's what it was about. So this is a copy of the patent granted to Thomas uh, Cutler, who um, gained possession of the land we stand on and the next section down from here. And what did they do with it? Not a lot. Not a lot. They did, did build a dock next door where the Big Willow is in front of Viridian Building. A very basic dock was built, put it right there. What Thomas Cutler was probably more known for was he built a house and hotel, uh, boarding house is more reality, at the intersection of uh, Front and Union. This was Cutler House, also known as Mansion House or Union House, which is where um, the southwest corner of that intersection. So that's where um, the dish was and, you know, the uh, coffee store and the, the like. This was of a certain size, uh, but was an institution. And that building was there until the 1890s. And the building that there today was originally the Hotel Traverse and the Wilhelm department store, which was at one time five stories and it's now just two. But that was the colors, probably more known for an engineer in the house, but one time on this property. In 1874, it was bought by Reuben Goodrich. Now we're pretty familiar with uh, Perry Hanna and the story of Traverse City. So much so, we made it, he has a statue and like, he has the big house. Now, Perry Hanna was Coca-Cola. Reuben Goodrich was Pepsi. Actually, it's more like RC. But Reuben Goodrich was born in 1819. The Goodrich family came from New York. A large number of these people came from Western New York. And he was the youngest of eight children. His older brothers moved to what was then Atlas, uh, Michigan, in Genesee County, and basically built the village. By the time he was of age, uh, Reuben was postmaster and knew about branding. So he renamed the town Goodrich. Smart guy. 
So I also eventually would serve as, as a legislator. And at age 41, he took what he learned as a legislator and moved to Traverse City. There was much discussion about the, uh, how the property that was available was going to be allocated in this area. At this time, Grand Traverse County included many of what are counties today, including Leelanau. So he removed himself, as they said, to uh, Traverse City. And in 1860, at age 41, and when he came here, he, also being clever, uh, soon became at the U.S. Land Office, which had um, been moved to Traverse City. That's basically the headquarter for the allocation of real estate uh, with the patents like we saw. He became the receiver. At the U.S. Land Offices, you had the registrar and the receiver. The registrar did official, did the official paperwork, the registrar was the one, well, I'm sorry, the receiver was the one who took the money. It's kind of like the nuclear codes on a submarine where you got to have two keys to sell property at the time. You had to have a registrar and receiver. And he served nine years off and on because there was some political issues after, after the Civil War, as one might expect, um, and positioned himself in a, basically he was at the head of the line in prospecting real estate. Smart guy. So he, in the process, um, he was early in on, on the development of roads. I know it's a crazy concept, a brand new thing. Roads. We're going to build a road, what is still, you can see signage around here, the Nuego to Northport Road. Um, at that time, he did plenty of investing in real estate. Um, especially in, in what is now Grand Traverse in Leelanau County. He also, in the 1860s, joined Henry Campbell in the Campbell and Goodrich um, Grocery and Dry Goods in Northport. In the 1860s, there were four docks at Northport. And what they did was they provided cordwood to the steamers as they were making their way around the lake. Uh, Campbell and Goodrich was um, sort of the last of those and that was obviously it was kind of a seen unbeatable prospect. And Reuben Goodrich um, did, you know, invested heavily in that, maybe a little too much. Eventually, Henry Campbell and uh, Reuben Goodrich and bankrupt in that process. But that's not the end of the story. Um, Goodrich sort of reinvented himself a little bit in real in more real estate. Honestly, at that time, bankrupt wasn't quite a stigma. Yeah, it's a frontier. We're doing stuff. But in 1874, he purchased from Thomas Cutler the underdeveloped property where we sit here on lot number three. One of the first things he did was um, redo the Cutler dock. Every, every year around Halloween, I sent out the story that um, Goodrich had hired Godfrey Grayling, the old Austrian himself, the old Bohemian, who spoke five different languages, none of them English. <laughs> and um, with his son, he was hired to rebuild the Cutler Dock into the Goodrich Dock. This was a big undertaking, and they brought in a steam hammer and the like. Unfortunately, Godfrey, who had survived the revolutions of 1848, um, in Central Europe and brought his family here and established himself in then Norristown, eventually it would be Greylithville, but stuck his head in to take a closer look and was hit by a steam hammer on the head and came to his, the end of his natural days. So occasionally, if you see a headless Austrian walking around the Viridian property, how you know? So. There we go. So, eventually as things progress and Traverse City grows, um, of course the idea of the um, state hospital, Perry Hanna, is able to secure the state hospital and the building of the state hospital and the like. Huge boom, huge boom, of course, for Traverse City. Now, what's it made out of? We all know it's made out of yellow brick up there. Where does the yellow brick come from? Brickyards. 
Where does the yellow brick come for our state hospital? The Markham Brickyard, which is where the Pathfinder School is now. How do you get all that brick from there to where the state hospital is? Essentially, you build a road. There was already a road, but you needed a more stable road that didn't turn to mud. They built a tramway, or essentially a railroad out of wood from the state hospital construction site to uh, up to the Markham Brickyard. Now, when you're building, especially in the 1880s and building something out of brick, you're gonna need a lot of mortar. And also, you're gonna make a lot of plaster because the interior is also no sheetrock. So a lot of lath, a lot of plaster. Key ingredient to hold all this stuff together is mortar and plaster. And what's that stuff made out of? Key ingredient, oh, there's a picture of, of the Markham Brickyard. Key ingredient in that is lime. How do you get lime? You build a kiln and you burn limestone to produce lime. Reuben Goodrich is able to get in on this and leases this property to a group called Harper and Latimer from Manistee who secured the contract for lime and um, built for $3,000, which is a big amount of money in 1883, build a kiln, I keep pointing, right over there, build a kiln to build limestone. They, acquired, they took shipment of limestone from Washington Island, Door County in Wisconsin, and shipped it here to the dock so the good rich stock unloaded the burn and that lime was put on the tramway to deliver to state hospital site. They also had advertisements in the paper saying, hey, if you need a foundation, if you want a full limestone foundation, we can set you up. Put your order in from, for Wisconsin limestone. So that first major thing here on this property is a kiln, a lime kiln, which is currently the site of it is probably underwater, just right up there. So now, of course, we built the uh, built an asylum. Now, what happened to Reuben Goodrich? He basically, as I said, he became known as the good roads man, promoting roads um, through the territory, territory uh, through the counties. But also, um, when you look at the old maps, if you happen to live in northern Slabtown, what we call Slabtown, which probably is more the Elmwood neighborhood. Um, your property, if you look at the deeds north of Randolph, is in the Goodrich editions. And Reuben himself lived on Elm One. But this is one of the few within the city of editions that were not a Hannah Lay edition, but it was a Goodrich uh, edition. So there we go. Here's a nice picture of, he lived till 1898. He is the gentleman there, second to the left. Over here, this is an old settlers gathering um, in 1898. Per Perry Hanna is back row center. And those are some of the grand old men of Traverse City. So, okay, this is things where things pick up. In 1885, Norris Eastman, so it's a gentleman who just out of nowhere comes, literally kind of out of nowhere because he came from the uh, Dakota territories, out of state. The Dakota Territories, as we said, with the amount of lumber being moved through northern Michigan, uh, he came as a speculator and purchased this property from Goodrich. And what he did, um, soon said to he must have had a fair amount of capital, was he built a lumber mill, and a sizable lumber mill, fully um, outfitted for production, saw the possibilities of buying lumber, mill milling it himself, and shipping through the dock that came with the property. Uh, this was a pretty substantial uh, undergoing. The great thing about it was it had a steel roof, which for the time was kind of breakthrough, pretty expensive, but it was thought to be more or less fireproof. And he also you know, collected some of the lumber lands around here as well. Now, he was a he was a rambling man. I mean, his wife only stayed for about three years. Eventually moving on to Louisiana. Who knows? May have been legal entanglements. But 
they before they left, they got into a partnership with Dan Carter. Dan Carter was uh, Traverse City's pioneer, pioneer jeweler. He actually was, he was born in New York, uh, went to school in Pennsylvania, um, spent, learned his trade as a jeweler in Ohio, and in his mid-twenties got into a little trouble with speculation in oil. This was the earliest days of oil. And got in a little trouble and exited and moved to northern Michigan, where he built basically the preeminent um, jewelry business in first in Benzonia, where he also had built uh, a mill, but then Traverse City. Now, if you're going to have a pioneer small town, you've got to have several key professions. And having a jeweler is one of them. Not only jewelry itself makes good conservation of portable wealth, but jewelers are also mechanics. And that's really what um, Dan Carter was. He's the person you would go to fix your watch. And at this time, in the mid 1800s, he moved to Traverse City in the late 1860s, the beginning of the manufacturing era, that having timepieces, accurate timepieces that work for key for industrial management. So that's important, come into that. So by 18, 87, he enters a partnership with the Eastmans, a couple other partners, for the purchase of the mill, which is right here. This, this is just basically wraps it up that this property at that time included next door as well, probably a little bit to the south, 735 feet of uh, waterfront. Um, they include, uh, well, like including, including the dock. Um, he continued to develop as not only a sawmill in dimensional lumber, but a planing mill producing finished lumber. And improving to the like, this is a clip that says, uh, yeah, I think it's about 1893, that they installed a new 26 foot double surfacer and sizer. What does that mean, Jordan? This means a very large contraption, 26 feet long, to not only slice, but edge large pieces of lumber, 26 feet long, um, with an endless bed that dropped 12 feet, side spindles that are eight feet tall, serious business. Now, this was in the Hardwood area. In 1887, Hannah Lay sold the big mill downtown because they knew the age of the big pine trees were over and we were making a transition to the Hardwood era. Hardwood, there are many industries in town processing maple and hemlock and um, locusts and the like for miscellaneous purposes. Anything that involves plastic today, remember at one point it was probably made out of wood, including the old dish factory that uh, made the basically small trays for butter. Good example. The Carter Mill, right here, at one point was capable of producing 10,000 umbrella handles a day. That's a lot of umbrella handles. Right here, you're cranking those things out. Now, next picture. This is the Greylick. These are the Greylick docks. I'm just showing you this as an example that up the road at Greylickville, what is now um, the marina here, this is a much more extensive dock that on this side is the lumber dock. And that's the slab piece of land basically that connects to the current uh, break water there, sheet piling. This extends at a more acute angle out for their lumber dock. This is their slab dock, which was not only a piling of the slab material, um, and this dock is essentially where center point is today. But it shows you have a lumber dock, you have a slab dock over here. And just so you know, the uh, the uh, this picture moving on, that's the Greylick Mill up the ways, which was a very large mill. They could do um, up to uh, a million and a half board feet a year right there. Uh, steam mill. 
Now, as I've been working on this, I really wanted to find pictures of here, of the Carter Mill. Hard to find. So I spent a lot of time looking at older pictures, seeing if I could find the Carter Mill in the background. This is a picture taken uh, from the um, cupola at the Central School, at the wooden version of the Central School, right where the cent Central Grade School is today. But the Traverse City Central School, taken from that cupola probably about 1896, maybe a little bit later, and this is the intersection of Wadsworth and Sixth. These houses still there. And let's examine what some other interesting things in this photo, what we're going to find. Fortunately, this was done, I'm not going to say it was glass plate, but it was done with a very long exposure and captured a lot of details. And even though the stuff's blurry in the background, if you know what you're looking for, it's there. In the background here, that is the Great Lake Dock extending. And there's Great Lakeville there. There's the Norris Elementary School right up there. Um, oh, also here, see that? Those are, those and in the river are cut logs waiting being processed at the Hannah Mill, Hannah Lay Mill. And the reverse of that, these are the um, similar time period are the logs on the rollaway as well. That's basically at the intersection where Fifth. Uh, Fifth Street runs into the bend of the river. Now right here, this is the QE Bowie uh, Farm Implement and Carriage Warehouse and Dealership. Anybody have any idea what this might be today? No, it's full gorillas. <laughs> this is at that time the Chicago and Western Michigan Railroad Line which came down through what we now call Hanna Park and swept around and went right next to Polgarelli's, what is now Polgarelli's right there. So, um, looking even more, and way in the background, that's the Carter Mill right there. And this is the Carter Dock, standing out Possibly maybe even further than what we think about with the fuel docks over there. So, let me see. I wasn't going to skip that. And what I'm showing you here is one of the insurance maps. This is a representation. This is, there was a company that went basically everywhere and created very detailed maps of towns that provided information for the fire departments of the town. So they knew what to expect if there was a fire. And it detailed all of the, uh, what was inside buildings, how tall they were, if they were made of wood and uh, brick, if there was an engine and the like. I know it's a little blurry and it's hard to see uh, in the conditions, but this is the Carter Mill right here. This is Carter Road. That is the mill itself. This is the slab dock. There was a second dock right out in front here. And that's where they piled their slabs. Here's the lumber dock, which essentially is what was the old Goodrich dock, which became known as the Carter dock, which is in front of the Viridian building. These uh, little, basically the dotted lines show where lumber piles would be put. This long line is a tramway itself, because how lumber mills work, at the time was that the cutting actually happened on the second floor. There was a separate engine compartment that drove a uh, spindle that drove leather belts. And upstairs, you, they pulled logs from the water here up an incline up to the second floor. Uh, they were cut on the second floor. The sawdust fell through the floor. And then the cut lumber was taken out into the yard. So. Um, over time, this is this is from this one in particular is from 1899 as the most detailed of these. Um, as we get into uh, the early 1900s, things begin to change. So what I do? Oops. Let's see. Let me double check. 
I mean, um, mainly because, oops, my slides may have gotten out of order. Hey, J.O. Yes. Question. Yes. So, were they floating the lumber yes. down the boardman and then floating They were floating it from everywhere. And then across the bay to the mill? They were floating the lumber from everywhere. So um, both down the bay, up the bay, and the land. And lumber was moved, uh, was moved out of the woods in the wintertime, using the snow and, or across the ice. And what we saw with the rollaways there where, where logs were stacked, that was done during the winter. And that was basically the inventory reserve for the mills. And the river, the Boardman River itself, and Boardman Lake were stacked with, that, with those lumbers. So, all right. So, meanwhile, in 2021, during the pandemic, J.O. is looking through old photos online from the Traverse Area Historical Society, and he finds this picture. He goes, well, there's something going on in the background, but otherwise it's a beach with some miscellaneous trash. I start taking a hard look, and you know, just like when they do on CSI, and they go, enhance. Enhance. So I start to do that, and I go, wait a minute, I know this place. And I start going, is that the Carter Mill? And I start putting stuff together. I think this is the Carter Mill. That right there is a slab dock. Here, what we see right here is kind of the north-south axis of the mill. This gets a little bit closer on here is the slab dock. Behind, you can see the larger lumber dock pointing out. Jordan, what do you mean by slab dock? What is a slab dock? Slab dock is where they collected all the offcuts. What slabs are is when you take a round, a round yeah. log and you turn it into a square to create dimensional lumber. Just slabs. So just slabs. What we call slab, slab town, slab town, is because they would take the uh, those slabs were free to the mill workers and would be used and turned into building material. So these slabs, they were offcuts that could be used to fuel the mill for burning, could be used um, for all sorts of different, just generally, they were basically the off product. Yeah. So, yeah, there we go. Yeah, they, there was a dock to ship the slabs? And why was they, were, they were put there because also at this time they were good that fuel for steam steam engines, steam boats, ah, okay. and another thing, it was a just place to put it. Also, slab docks could potentially be made entirely out of slabs. The Greylick dock was probably made completely out of slabs. I'm not sure about this one. Um, in a, when you get a closer look at this photo, and this is not good with this projector, but between the mill and the dock here, you can actually see Power Island right there. Oh, yeah. This um, smokestack right there, that's the kiln. What was the lime kiln? So, and this is just another of the enhance. Um, you see, this is the ramp leading up to the saw deck mm -hmm. that they would drag the logs up into there. Uh, there's a boat right here. Uh, not sure what that is, but the kiln, smokestack, like the engine was over here. Now Wes knows this, there was, for those of, those of you old timers, back in the year 2000, um, <laughs> that in the members room, also known as the O'Brien room, now called the Town room, there was a spring that came through the floor, a well. And this actually is recorded in other documents. There was a well that fed into the, into the mill and before the fire, that uh, well was accessible at the bar in the members room for branch water for the bar. So, there we go. Okay, we're gonna speed this up so we can get going. So just so you know, I've taken a little bit of uh, comparison and find more or less where you would, where you would look at uh, from the same angle from the club. When we stand in this line, lawn, we think we're looking straight um, due east, but really we're looking more southeast. So the angle of the property actually makes it, projects out so you see more 
of the clubhouse and the mill. So it's very similar. And Power Island, Marion Island, it's more or less in the same place. <laughs> so there you go. We, we, we did move the island. Um, and just also found that um, in other postcards, you see more evidence of the old Carter Dock. This is Angle looking it down. Uh, this is from the 30s. You can see the Park Place uh, Hotel, and you can see the remains of the Carter Dock. Same sort of, same sort of postcard taken from the beach on the north side of the Meridian Building, full force of the pilings. And if you look, there's sort of the same view today. If you show up at the right time when there's high pressure right now, you can see some of those pilings. Oh, wow. And I was just over there after this couple days ago. You can see the base of those pilings still in there. All right. Now, Dan Carter. That's the mechanic was a very clever, clever guy. He had left being a jeweler, but his mind didn't stop working. He was an inventor as well. First, he developed a folding table. This is breakthrough technology. <laughs> He was not the only inventor of a folding table. There are many different patents on the folding table. But he came up in 1896. This is his patent for a folding table. But more excitingly, he came up with a deck chair. <laughs> this is Dan Carter's adjustable chair for invalids and resorters and people on vacation. Uh, the great thing about Dan Carter's adjustable chair is that you could fully recline. It was made with a ratcheting device at the top, which allowed you to adjust the length of the canvas. So it could be a bed, it could be a reclining chair, all sorts of stuff. Um, his son-in-law, Dan Carter by this time was on wife number two, and his son-in-law, who was uh, worked for him, his name was Laverne, Laverne Wood, uh, was sent out into the hustings to gather up business coast to coast, traveled to New York, uh, traveled to California taking orders for a victory chair. Whoa. Banded in 1898. Why would you call it the victory chair? Why would you call it the victory chair? Spanish American Civil War. This was sort of a this was sort of a peak of McKinley patriotism. Very, you know, lots of play, lots of play. But the victory chair. Now, we'll find, you know, we're not sure the victory uh, chair was a huge success because 1901, up the road, there was a fire at the Peterson Mill which was the original mill in Sutton Bay, and uh, was originally the Steinle Mill, but was run by Einar Peterson, who was a Norwegian. And he came down the road and offered Dan, Co um, Dan Carter, I want to buy everything. I want to buy all your machinery. What's it going to cost? And Dan Carter sells it to him. So everything is packed up, all the machinery, it's back up here and moved to Sudden Spain. Now, we're going to put a pin in the story of the mill because we got to get to, and I've got to speed this up real quick because I know time is going by. We got to get to the Montague family. This is second chapter about this is a set of three brothers. I'm sorry, two sets of three brothers. Um, the first of them is a set of brothers from Old Mission. Their family, like a lot of people, in migrated from uh, western New York, then to Wisconsin, and eventually coming to um, Old Mission and taking in the um, mid-1850s, actually, I think early 1860s, uh, putting land claims out very close to the end. There's a Montague, Montague Road out there for reference. Oldest brothers, uh, Herbert H., I'm sorry, just plain Herbert Montague, he grew to be, he was the oldest brother, and like many oldest brothers, was upstanding and an achiever, eventually rose to be the, um, sec the general secretary 
of Hannah Lay was general manager of the Mercantile Bullet. The second brother was Joseph Montague. He too, uh, you can say there's a, a division in ages uh, by I think close to 10 years. Uh, in 1856, Joseph Montague was born and two years later, his uh, brother, Victor. Uh, those two are gonna be key in this story. Now, Herbert uh, started at Hanalei back when it was on Bay Street and rose through the company to become the um, general manager of the mercantile was there when they opened the big store. He also became the secretary and treasurer of Hanalei which probably made him the most powerful of the non-made men in the company. So he eventually would also be the Grand Mason of the Michigan Lodge, which was basically top mason in the state, which then, in 1908, was a big deal. Uh, his brother Joseph, um, upbringing him and Victor, spent an idyllic uh, childhood out on the peninsula, lots of farm work, but also lots of play on the water. Um, Joseph went to work for the mercantile and probably went to work on the ships, uh, including the city of Traverse City, the Grand Rapids, and the facts that that's the Grand Rapids. Um, but, like many people within the company, he was encouraged by Perry Hanna to strike out on his own. So what did he do? He joined the hardware store next door. This is Front Street. Um, this is the Dupree and Montague store. In the mid 1880s, it's all the way here on the left. It's a wooden store, and originally at that time, um, Dupree was a tin knocker. It basically fixing up tin um, and metal for hardware uses, home heating, and the like. Same location, same store. Uh, this is probably early 90s, uh, right there. This is taken from basically there was a porch over the front sidewalk of Hannah Lay. Now the thing about the Montagues, these two brothers, they love boating. That was their thing. Um, even at this time, uh, Joseph Montague had bought his first, his first yacht, so to say. At one time they had taken their, uh, taken the family's small sailboat, 18 foot sailboat, and Joseph and Victor and their friend, believe it or not, Ed Reynolds, <laughs> sailed their 18-foot boat. And Ed Reynolds was actually a professor at Yale. At this point in time, Old Mission was, a was beginning to be a resort community. And so they took that boat in 1882 and traveled to Mackinac and back and said, this is great, we gotta do this all the time. So, um, through the uh, 1880s, Victor Montague became a self-trained boat builder and designer. And at this point in time, they got, because the media and books and magazines were more extensive than you would think in how things spread, was the same time as the international canoe movement. That sounds crazy, but it's not that crazy. Uh, starting in England, uh, canoes, the idea of Canoe, a canoe is a one man or two person versatile cruising vessel had caught up. There was a man named John McGregor who made a series of boats called Rob Roy, who pioneered this idea. And he founded the original Canoe Club, which became the Royal Canoe Club. Um, and he also was the co-founder of the American Canoe Association. That's a cigarette card um, representing the ACA. Now, one of the people who helped them actually was a man by the name of Warrington Baden Powell, who had a series of brothers and sisters. Baden Powell took his younger brothers and sisters on camping trips by canoes, and the youngest one was so inspired he went on to form the Boy Scouts. So canoes have long legs. These gentlemen are at a canoe camping uh, rendezvous, I believe, on Long Island. So. Uh, so you know what a sailing canoe looks like. These are examples. They were basically canoe called canoe yawls. Um, and for one or two people, they were in some ways the first high performance sailing vessel, but also were built for cruising as well. 
and encouraged long voyages and trips and the like. The, John McGregor wrote many books about traveling throughout Europe, the Middle East, into Africa um, with his canoe. So, all right. Now, you know, I talked about that, you know, this, this cruising up originally an 18 foot uh, pretty basic boat, probably hard shine, but that continued on with a series of canoes that were built by Victor for the brothers. This is a picture of a crossing probably somewhere between, uh, somewhere near Mackinac. This is out of the big lake. And this is in 1893, uh, taken by Professor Grierson, who eventually would be the superintendent of schools in Grand Rapids. But like I said, not only did they go cruising, they went cruising pretty much every year from 1882 at least through 1911 in a series of boats that grew in size. Uh, they started out with the small sloop, then uh, Joseph Montague bought, the, uh, bought a small schooner into the canoes and then larger vessels. This is just a little bit of different places that they went on record well into Superior on that shore uh, throughout the North Channel into Georgian Bay. Now remember, there's no power involved. Joseph Montague basically invented cruising the North Channel. So, and in 18, a uh, record of his cruise in 1893, in 1894, he wrote an article for Rudder, Sail, and Paddle magazine, which eventually evolved into the Rudder magazine. If you're of a certain age or a certain ilk, you know, the Runner Magazine was probably one of the leading yachting pop, um, publications through most of the 20th century, although it tailed off and came to an end in 1977. But uh, Montague wrote an article describing one of his trips um, by canoe uh, in 1893. I just so happened to found that in the historic record, because you can find anything on the internet, that in all the volumes across the maritime uh, museums across the world, they didn't have that issue. But for some reason, I found one for sale. And spent probably enough money I had to ask my wife if it was okay. <laughs> so I have actually, I've scanned the article, and if you're interested, there are copies that you're welcome to take later. Um, but moving on, at the same time, uh, Montague's business grew. Um, they built the wood store, turned into the brick store on Front Street, uh, still there today, we'll see it in a second. Victor Montague's boat building operation moved into the city and moved to what's now uh, 447 East Front. So we say here, uh, small yachts, launches, pleasure craft, uh, pleasure craft, and other ads, shouldn't say uh, canoe yachts especially. Uh, his shop, this is a later picture, but this is probably from about 1896. His picture was on the other side from the Weekaton Club. His brother was the first president of the Weekaton Club, the uh, Traverse State's first social club, which is uh, at Indian, what was Indian Point at the time, um, right next to the uh, GR and I, Grand Rapids and Indiana Trestle. Yes, it is. And Montague, Victor Montague, was sort of the hair shop of Northern Michigan. He, anytime you see a vintage picture of sailing um, from postcards or the like, it's probably a Montague boat. This is Victor Montague himself and his own boat uh, out in front of the Wichita Clubs right there. Uh, courthouse is right there. This is probably about 1900 because we know that because of the courthouse there. Anna Lay right there. Um, the Steinberg Opera House, not the city opera house, but the opera house that was next to where the State Theater is now right there. A little closer up, you can see this is kind of a distinctive um, Montague design. And it basically, it kind of looks like somebody who's self-trained. 
It's very round. It's very kind of legs in. This is a picture of, and we saw that there was a rise in the boats. This is um, Joseph Montague had his brother built kind of his first proper yacht. This is uh, the on oh, I'm sorry, Onawak, which was uh, about 36 feet in length. Um, a lot of these photos you find in the back background of something else. But this is, these were centerboard, centerboard boats. They certainly had a significant keel, but they also had a centerboard. Um, this picture, that's probably the same boat that was in that picture before. This picture is the uh, second boat, the Kyoshek, which was 42 feet on deck. We can talk about there as well. And a little bit closer. And these were, like I said, this is a postcard from 1901. I can tell you this is August 15th in 1901. This is the annual regatta of the Weekton Club. Um, that is Onawa, which at that time was by the Vaughn family of Old Mission, who were a family of uh, doctors and biologists. And that's the bigger boat, Kyosha. All these names come from the Song of Hiawatha, which was a very popular white man's imagination of native culture and native myth. But the names were taken from that. So that's a little little bit closer up. Yeah. See the men on the boat sailing. Uh, Kayosha, bigger boat, won the race, by the way. Um, and other boats in the background. That is actually a motor sailor owned by Frank Friedrich, a little shoe merchant. Jo, yes. the Wicked Club, is that where Clinch is today? No, it is where basically the bridge is right now. Oh, they, just to the west of the bridge. Okay, right, got it. Um, come back next year and we're going to do the complete history of the Wicked Club. <laughs> but the uh, Victor uh, Montague's crowning achievement was launched in 1903, which was the Yall Gem, which Sorry. stepped away from the uh, Native American names and was named for his wife, Gertrude Emmeline Montague. Um, this is uh, 53 feet on deck. It was a yawl, can't tell from the angle. But it was a substantial boat, probably still to this day the biggest boat built, the biggest private boat. That's spectacular, how big? 53 on deck. Probably, you know, early 40s uh, in online. This is another picture you can see, you can tell it's a yawl because they've got the mizzen up at anchor. Not sure where that is, that's a little bit closer. And that's a little bit closer there. Um, this is the same boat at, uh, at anchor. In the winter time, where do you keep your boat? No way to really haul the boat. They kept the boat in the river, moving water. You can see the canvas work but anchored in the river. This is from 1913, uh, the back door of the Wicked So, okay, moving on. We haven't even gotten to the mowers. I'm gonna hurry up. All right, just so you know, the Montague building, the Montague block, is currently part is the uh, eastern edge, eastern side of the M22 building. There, there's an earlier picture that shows the Montague block and the Markham block right there. Uh, around this time, around 1900, they also, Montague's, Joseph Montague built his home on Fifth Street, as one does, uh, which is still there, 5246 5, Street. Victor Montague, his brother, his wife uh, was of ill health, and they moved in 1905 to move to Mobile, Alabama, where he reconstituted his boat shop. Unfortunately, there was a hurricane in 1910, which wiped out prob probably all record and plans of the boats that you've seen. One of the best friends in the straw that stirred the drink, the Montague family was Charles Murray. Charles Murray was the chief agent of the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad here in Traverse City and arrived in 1894. He was, it's kind of like uh, the music man, but he was a little less shit. Um, the GRI, was a land was the first railroad in town and was a land grant railroad, which means they had priority for um, purchasing real estate to make the railroad happen. 
um, GRI, other than being the first railroad in town, their business model was based on extracting resources from this area, moving freight from here, and what do you do on the other side? You bring tourists. So you do things like bring, help build the Grand Hotel. They were one of the partners in the Grand Hotel. And they also promoted the area for likely vacationers. Uh, Joseph Murray, I'm sorry, Charles Murray, when he got here said he met Joseph Montague, who had, was part of the group that founded the Weekatong Club in 1892, got there and said, well, this is a fine idea. Let's take this club, let's build something. So they built the Weekatong Club, I'm sorry, there at the mouth of the river over um, contractor that from inception in March to opening in August was put there. And he made this happen because this land here was all Grand Rapids and Indiana land. So there you go. Now, Murray was also an enthusiast. He had already had, uh, soon in 1894, at the same time they were building the Week Town Club, he had um, Victor Montague build a, uh, build a sailing canoe for him, 21 foot sailing canoe. And by 1897, he ordered up a, uh, from the Racine Manufacturing Company, an electro vapor launch. Now this was a naphtha launch. Anybody know the difference between a gasoline launch and a naphtha launch? It's an interesting idea. Naphtha launch is more like a steam thing, but it's not steam. You are actually boiling what essentially is gasoline, turning it into vapor, not igniting it, it's not a combustion engine, but the same operation at a lower temperature, turning the, the uh, fuel into vapor. So it's not only the fuel, it creates the vapor of power. So he ordered from that and had a, this is a postcard, this is a Norsen Peck um, postcard that where they've taken the launch and combined it with a different image of the waterfront. You can see the pennants as Commodore, I know that was presented to Charles at some point in time, actually with the opening of the club. So that was a few years at the time. But, there we go. This was the beginning of the launch era. I know, it's already 8.08, so I'm gonna keep it moving. We haven't even got to the mowers, it's terrible. Um, it was also big into ice boats, but getting to the launch thing. Before the rise of automobiles, the first gasoline engine, their first applications was more in small boats. The uh, small boat, the gasoline engines, usually very small horsepower, anywhere between 10, uh, I'm sorry, two and 10 horsepower, were applied to um, small boats called launches. Now, here in town, we've got a problem to access the river. This is, at that time, was the Ott Mill, the third owners down from Perry Hanna. The river had essentially a makeshift dam that collected the logs before they came up onto the sawmill. In the early years, uh, between you know, 19, 1904, 19, actually 1900, 1908, there was a movement to make Traverse City nice and not so industrial. And one of those ideas was we'd like to use the river. I know, it's a crazy idea. So, uh, by 1905, there were over 60 launches in town, and it was the fashionable thing to do. This is from a magazine article in the Motorboat magazine. Um, that actually is the guy who was the uh, editor of the Record Eagle, his launch. And by as early as 1900, there was an idea that the Weekton Club is not really a great spot to have a boat club. We need a different boat club. We need a boat club for our launches. Maybe sailboats, but someplace that's a little more suitable. Uh, Charles Murray in 1905 was named the first Commodore of the Traverse City Motorboat and Sailing Club. And they were looking for a location. First choice was actually at the end of Fifth Street at the Crook at the River. That was the first discussed. Rejected. Too shallow, 
not convenient at all. Second choice was the Carter Mill. Maybe right here would be a good place for a phone call. So, now, you can see this is the river at the bend of the river. There was discussion in the like at this time talking about making the river nice. The elephant is an advertisement for the candy company at where North Peak was, is. Um, you can see in postcards that Hannah Park all cleaned up and the like. That vision never really came to use of the uh, river as a usable recreational river. Problem with the Weekaton Club and location, for one thing, not very accessible. The other thing is, Traverse City really didn't have an organized sewage. So all the runoff and a fair amount of sewage went out the river. And while it did, that didn't happen until 1933. So that made it not only difficult to keep boats, but kind of discouraged some things. They did a lot to try to funnel the river with pilings out past it. And the Wicketong Club basically evolved, still evolved into a beach club. So now Charles Murray's son, Irving Murray, um, actually I graduated high school in, in uh, 1904, he bought the business from Victor Monaghan there at uh, 447 East Front, the boat says 444, advertisements and the like, and stuck it out over time. The older folks amongst you may remember Bert Murray's Boats and Motors on Front Street which evolved over time from Irving, who passed in 1937. His wife took over the business, and their daughter married a gentleman named Clarence Allgaier, who eventually took over the business as well. And people uh, like, I remember Bill Allgaier worked for his uncle, Murray's Boats and Motors. So yes, it is Paisanos. See that from the river? Uh, the bones of it may be the place, but I think the building's been built several several times. So, yes, it is Paisanos. Meanwhile, at the Carter Dock, while no industry is happening. Oh, here's the other thing. On a uh, kind of an early spring day, um, Charles Murray in 1907 was motoring uh, basically right past here, just right straight out, and was hit by a stroke, had a stroke and died shortly afterwards, uh, not on the boat, he was taken off the boat. But with that, the idea, as Charles Murray, just as he organized the Wicketon Club, um, they were left without somebody motivated enough to organize a club. So the Traverse City Motorboat and Sailing Club did not come to pass in this location. Uh, the facility here went through a couple iterations. Uh, the city tried to entice a refrigerator company to establish here, an icebox. And then later, a uh, Mac Cult, the Mac Cultivator Company, a company that in 1909 and 1910 made a two-row beet cultivator device for basically helping uh, for planting and growing beets. But other things happened, like uh, the winter storage of some of the commercial vessels around here. This is uh, the Czech Megan. Somebody's going to correct me on the uh, pronunciation, which is one of the boats that served Bassett Island and the pavilion out there. That is the boat in season, and this is uh, the boat at the at what we call the slab dock earlier here at, uh, at the Carter Mill. So, okay, we're getting to the mowers, and we're going to go real quick. So, this is the second set of brothers. Oldest brother, born 1881, is Hubert. H. Money, known as Firth. Like all bro older brothers, he's an overachiever. Uh, he's valedictorian of his class in uh, 1900. Uh, as part of the Senior Lyceum, he gives uh, oration, informative oration, earlier about the international yacht races between the United States and Great Britain. Uh, he and his brother have grown up on, on his dad's sailboats. He would go to University of Michigan, get a degree in electrical engineering, and um, would work for Western Electric both in Chicago and New York. Uh, this is a picture actually taken on upstairs in the lodge room of uh, the Montague block of the hardware store. This is probably, these group of uh, folks are 
yeah, probably age early high school. Right in there is, um, is Bert Montague. But this is, many people say that with the baby boom generation, they invented the idea of a teenager. That's not true. This generation invented the idea of a teenager. This was the first children of merchants and professionals as we know and basically created their own miniature teenage society. So, and this generation that um, Bert Montague was part of had a lot of leading lights. People would go on to be familiar in like Lars Hoxted and Harold Titus, which if you're a Traverse City history nerd means something, but other than that. Now the second brother was Herb Montague, who like many second brothers, uh, occasionally runs afoul of things. Now, he was, um, he did not go on to college, he went directly into working for his dad at the hardware store. Um, when his uncle Victor removed to Mobile, uh, he left an unfinished sailing canoe, which uh, Herb finished, and unfortunately was the source of a traumatic experience. While sailing on June 11th, 1906, with his best friend uh, Bob Price, oh, I'm sorry, Bob Chase, uh, the thermal kicked in, and they were they capsized and were in the water uh, for at, at hour three that um, Herb had a hand on Bob, but unfortunately let go with hypothermia, and Bob Chase was drowned. Um, Joseph Montague, um, Herb's father, was out sailing on Jim at the time, and eventually uh, other, not only they came, but other people came, and Herb was rescued, but this was a traumatic experience. It probably shaped some things in his life. Um, moving on, by 19, at that time, he was like 20 years old. Um, later, he opened in 1912, he opened a, uh, garage, an automobile garage that would later be a Buick dealership, um, but got involved in a rather nasty lawsuit that went all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court and was decided against their favor. It was basically involving some light mortgage fraud. <laughs> light fraud. I wish we had John Lynch here because I sent it to him to explain it. I think the best way to say it is just light fraud. So, there was a third brother, Gerald Montague. Um, this is him in 1913 who was the kind of good, not a good brother, but he was the caretaker brother. He was the baby brother, and who actually lived uh, with his wife at the family home on Fifth Street well into the 40s. Um, meanwhile, back at Carter Mill, this is a postcard of the year, and it's hard to tell just because of the tones. This is more or less, the view is from if you were standing at the base of the Carter Dock, or basically by the willow tree. This is a little bit blown up right there, and you can see the mill itself right here. So, same view right there. Now, Bert returned at the time, you know, maybe a little bit after the crisis, but returned with the idea, I've been thinking a lot about lawnmowers, and I have ideas. So, sure enough, he developed some ideas, and over time in 1916, the Montague family, her buys the Carter. This is a 1920 insurance map that shows a much reduced uh, facility. Now, what Herb, I'm sorry, what Bert had been working, it's hard because there's Hubert and Herbert, but Bert, the older brother, worked on a design that involved um, what we became known as the monomower that involved small rotary discs that work together to shear grass blades. Not slice, shear. First, he came up with an idea that was more of a rotary, was a big wheel that was driven by the central, that's a rotating wheel as you can see there, but on the outside, this is kind of like a gigantic slicing device. This is like the battle bots. This could not be safe at all. And but that is a 1915 patent. Moving on, 1916, he had developed, um, actually, this is a further one. This is the 1923 patent 
of the monomower. Um, I just happened to bring my two monomowers with me. Happy to, happy to talk later about these. Um, but he continued to refine these devices over time. And by 1922, they were set to go in business as selling the monomower. Uh, this is another aerial photo that from the early 30s though, and you can see, if you look real hard, you can see the old mill right there. Just so you know, eventually, there was a fire in 1930, which burned down the mill. Um, these are um, the next series. Oh, there's a patch where there has obviously been a fire. This is a photo from 1965. That landing craft belonged to Pete Rennie who lived next door and at that time owned Power Island. And he would supply the island with his landing craft. I've always wanted a landing craft. This is one of my dreams. <laughs> Rotary used that for a long time yep. in the summertime. They would yep. take the, everybody from Rotary out to the island. Yep. Yep. Uh, the next photos were provided uh, courtesy, also courtesy of Glenn Rounds. Uh, these came from Fred Corp. Uh, who was an employee at the Monomill. This is inside at the Monomore. This is an assembly here. You can see these are the base of the pre-war Monomowers here, and they were hand assembled. Uh, this is in 1938. This is post-fire. They built one section here. I'll show you in a second where this is. But at the end of the Depression, the, the sales of the monomore, which were done by mail order, started out and built through the 20s, but unfortunately the Depression really, not a good time, slowed things down. But by the late 30s, consumerism had picked up again. Um, so fire in 1938, rebuilding with one structure, and they built another one right next door. See the first one we saw before. Another one right there. Nice pictures of the crew here. And this next picture, it's hard to see, but back in here is Bert Montague with a hat on. And there's his brother Gerald, the youngest brother right there. Um, just to show you, that first section is located here, and the second section. So, J.O., yes. that building on the left that's burned out? Yeah. What was that? Not sure. Okay. Not sure. Okay. Check in a couple of weeks. The second building was right here um, that we saw in the pictures. Additions, the additional spaces were made in 42, 43, and 45. I am, hard, I am looking hard at looking for the military contracts, because without a doubt, they got military contracts during World War II. To produce something that probably funded all of this stuff. Why was it named Carter Road? Because in 1948 they named Carter Road for Dan Carter. So they, just, they just named it for him. It didn't go to anything Carter related. No, he did own property up there. Okay. But that was named Carter Road, and I, my guess is that was commonly referred to as Carter Road because it was known at, in the news and everything when something happened around here, even though it became the monomore factory it was referred to. So-and-so happened near the Carter Mill. Okay. So, um, and then the last section, which is the club, was probably built you know, in 43 or 45. So, oh, all right, we're getting in. And you can see here the front wow. across there. Oh yeah, it's big. And go ahead, this is the full width of the parking lot. So, and this was a false front. If we go back to show you that that was a facade, and you can see that's actually pretty skinny back there. So, all right. Okay, so, just so you know, coming up, this is what the waterfront looked like when the club took over um, the property. Is that the original willow? Yeah. That's the willow, yeah. That's, is it called the Hero Tree? No, the Hero Tree is behind there. Oh, okay. Hero Tree is behind this. Uh, but this is the big willow out there. Um, Bert Montague passed away in June 1966.
basically two weeks after the club, well, about six weeks after the club took full possession in inhabiting the facility. Um, the Herb Montague, his brother who ran the sales operation out of Grand Rapids, um, he passed in 1970. And Gerald made it all the way until 1980. Gerald actually became a rather distinguished builder of model boats, including marble heads, which were remote control, um, remote control boats. Um, but where we're going with this is that I am sure the Montague family knew full well in selling the property to the Grand Traverse Yacht Club, that they were handing off a legacy, a tradition of the unfolding yachting club life through the ages, through from the late 1800s up till now. So the Montague family and the Murrays represented the roots of boating in Traverse City. And then, like I said, invented cruising through the North Channel and the like. So, just so you know, not just the mower factory. Now you know that the club isn't just, there's a reason, kind of a reason. It's a happy coincidence why we're here. So, sorry it took much more time than I expected. But, I, like I said, I've got the four hour version. And I can go in real detail, granular detail. We've also stick up on the screen, on the screen you'll put some of the ads. Uh, Herb ran the sales and marketing from Grand Rapids. He and his wife relocated to Grand Rapids. I have a feeling it was to kind of escape some of the bad memories that happened here. And established very aggressive uh, marketing, direct sales through magazines. Through Saturday Evening Post, Country Gentleman, Popular Science, Better Homes and Gardens, and with fantastic claims. Um, in fact, they're so fantastic, and you know, eight and a half pounds. Look at that. Look, look how look how expansive that monomower is. What a wide swath it does. Even a child can use it, save as can be. Not a problem. Won't tangle, won't get caught up, self oiling, all these things. Unfortunately, the FTC kind of caught up with <laughs> And there was a case from 54 to 56 which involved a cease and desist and basically removed her from being the uh, uh, prim agent, primary sales agent. And the uh, Monomore factory essentially came to its natural end about 62, 63. When did the breakwater go? 74. So there you go. Um, I said, like I said, Fantastic. we have, I've got more notes that I'll probably publish as well that include firsthand accounts from employees of the Monomore factory. They made approximately about, fifth, at peak production, about 15,000 mowers a year. About, at peak production, about 200 a day. Is that one of them there? Yeah, two of them. We Let's turn, turn on the lights. Yeah, turn the lights on. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. We want to see so it. This is a pre-war. This is oh, a pre-war monomore with, with the maple handle. And you'll have to see it up close, but these are um, these little, look like small flower rosettes that work together to shear the grass, um, blades of grass, and they're driven by, as you push along the grass, these wheels uh, work as a gear to spin the cutting blades. Have you tried it? I have tried it. It's more or less effective. <laughs> um, it is, and it's, they are self-sharpening blades. Most of the scissors that you and I use are really sheer, they don't slice. Uh, a pair of scissors that slices requires being sharpened on a more regular basis. This is the old sailmaker talking. Um, but this shears like two more, not going to say blunt, but things grinding something apart. So that's the 19th. This is, this was 
This is technically a Mark II. This is the second generation. Okay, well, where did you get it? Where like everything, eBay. eBay. <laughs> but this, this will, this will be, be a donated. This will be donated to the Greater Grand Traverse Yacht Club collection. Um, and this is a post-war model. And that's because they were running out of the, it was hard to access maple for the handles. So um, that Bert basically came up, drew up, and got a pen for this is just one length of steel twisted into the handle configuration. And one of the added advantages of the new steel handle was it acted as a shock absorber when you hit rocks and stuff. But this one is not quite as in good shape as the other one. But this is this is the uh, third version of the model mower, the Mark III. There was a fourth one that had, uh, in 1954, that had blades that were a little bit more open that you wouldn't clog as much. So I know way too much about mine. <laughs> this is a really good question. What was assembled? what was actually made. Did they cast uh, the parts here? I don't know. I will tell you though that uh, about four years ago, uh, Grace Van Strat was swimming kind of by the hero tree and came up and goes, J.O., what's this? And she pulled out, she had found one of the cutting wheels that was pretty well rusted up. But this, these little bits and pieces surface every now and then. Um, that's a monomotor. There you go. Yeah, and that's yes, and that's that's why the FTC probably said, hey, that's not really what you're welcome to take a look at the monomotor. If you'd like to take home a copy of Joseph Montague's article, 